Good morning. Good morning. That's getting better. All right. It is so good to be in God's house. It's so good to see each and every one of you. Are you happy to be here this morning? Amen. Would you rather be somewhere else? Okay, now don't say bed, because just because it's rainy and dreary, you know, I'm actually one of those weirdos who, for whatever reason, on Sunday morning, rain actually, I'm, it makes me wide awake. Any other day of the week, I'd rather sleep, but, you know, I'm excited to be here because I get to be with you guys. I love y'all, and it's a privilege to serve the Lord always. Amen? Amen. All right, well, let's get started this morning with our memory verse. We'll say it all together. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. All right, let's sing to our great God this morning.
missionary moment of the if my computer will go on with it. Give me all the tools for living on my own. 
Chicago um, actually supported, and we know, I believe he still is in attendance there, and so it's, it is a wonderful ministry. All right, we're going to continue on here, so let's take your hymnals, <coughs> you wish, and go to number 74. Our next song is Majesty.
bouncing in and out. It's working now. We'll see if the key works. All right, we have one more song before we have actually a special today before the message. So one more song to sing together. inside 
that I doubt that you still love me. But in your eyes there's only grace now. someone come in and then either instruct the police officer or instruct the judge, set them free. What are you talking about? His price has already been paid. I, I took care of it already. Let him go. You know, if we can't get to a place in our Christian life where we remain overwhelmed at the grace of God who loved us and saved us despite who we are. It doesn't matter what we read in the scripture. It doesn't no good just to say it. It's got to be real. It's got to be genuine. Now I didn't plan and, and fight, you know, I didn't ask her to sing that song this morning, but it fit perfectly because Paul is about to lay out a message to this Corinthians 
about why he serves the Lord in the ministry. And it's not for accolades. It's not to impress anybody here. But it's because God showed him love and then gave him that love for mankind and wanting to share it with as many as he possibly could. That's why it's important. Knowing what's important in life, it's what Jesus did for us. That's all that matters. The question is, what are we going to do with it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to start reading in verse 15. I'm going to read verses 15 through 21. Paul says, But I have used none of these things, and I'm not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case, for it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I've made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more to the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead and read down to verse 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Father God, as we come before you this morning, How can we say anything but thank you, Father? And Lord, those words just don't seem adequate. Father, the mercy and grace you have showed us continually is overwhelming. But God, I pray that we take time every day to stop and reflect on it. May we continually daily be overwhelmed by your love so that we might be compelled to go out and share it with others. Lord, it's only through your strength we're able to do that, but Father, you make it available to us that you will for our life. God, I pray with whatever days we may have left, either in this life or until you return, may we give them wholly unto you. Lord, just please bless us for these next few moments as we look into your word. Father, may we open our hearts and our ears to it. Father, I pray that we walk out these doors different than the way we came in. Father, even more compelled to love you and serve you. May it be your word spoken here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In chapter 9, in verses 15 through 27, Paul kind of restates and then continues to illustrate this principle. That love is the limit to Christian liberty, as well as his own policy of not using his right to be supported financially by those to whom he ministered. He gives two reasons why he refused to accept such support. First, he didn't want to lose his reward for preaching the gospel without charge. And second, and more importantly, he wanted absolutely nothing to hinder his reaching the lost with the gospel. Now, he just given six reasons in verses 1 through 14 why he had the right to be supported. In compelling the Corinthians and also any future readers, you ought to support the man of God that he brings into your church and into your lives. 
And then it's almost like, he says, but I'm not going to do it. They say, wait a minute, is he negating it? Is he contradicting it? I don't think at all Paul wants to confuse them. He starts off by saying in verse 15, but I have used none of these things. You know, he wouldn't take advantage even of his right for any reason. He didn't want the Corinthians to think he'd changed his mind and was not trying to convince them to begin supporting him. So he added, and I'm not writing these things that it may be done so in my case. I'm not writing this so that all of a sudden you'll get off your butts and start supporting me like you're supposed to. He says, I'm setting it aside and there is a reason for it. Let me explain. His thinking hadn't changed. He wasn't trying to confuse or contradict it was not his hope and desire that they begin paying him. He'd never taken pay for those he served directly, and he never intended to. He also wasn't asking for that now in some disguised way. That was just Paul's policy wherever he went. He reminded the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 2.9, You recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Paul wants his listeners and his readers to understand his love for them. In his very next letter to the Corinthians, he even repeated this reminder in Second Thess oh, I'm sorry, to his second letter to the Thessalonians. He says, Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you. He wouldn't even accept as much as a free meal from them. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 8 and 9 here in just a second. Paul had received support from the, Celest the Thessalonians after he left them, but not while he was working among them. It it's almost like he went there and the Lord allowed him to start a work there, to start to, a church up. And he didn't want to be a burden because, you know, he's just winning, you know, being used by the Lord to win some of these folks to Christ. And he's not trying to be like, okay, now that I've given you this message, here's what you owe me. Chose not to do that because he didn't want to burden them. But he says, now that you've come in, now that you've been growing in the Lord, you need to take care of the man of God that stays here and continues to minister to you. But he says, I didn't feel it was right for me to do that when we first got started. You know, without any doubt, the church at Thessalonica was among the Macedonian churches that helped support the apostle when he was working in Corinth. You know, Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 8 and 9, he says, I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. Now, I'm going to come back to that because that's kind of, a, <laughs> kind of an attention-grabbing statement. But in verse 9, he continues and says, And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. Like I said, i got to admit, as I started studying this and I read that phrase, it carries a strong note, he says, I've robbed other churches. When Paul was in Corinth, helping to establish the church, he refused to take anything from the Corinthians. He wanted to see that church be built up without the burden of having to pay a pastor until they were able to do so. However, he reminds them in his second letter that he was robbing other churches to minister to them. Now that phrase, robbing them, Get your attention, doesn't it? Robbing's not something we're supposed to do, right? Well, Paul is kind of being sarcastic here, but he's trying to make a point to get them to see. The meaning of the word Paul uses literally means to strip bare, to leave nothing behind. However, it's an oxymoron, because Paul wasn't literally robbing those other churches, but he did recognize that there were churches who were giving to him despite what very little they already had. They were sacrificing. And he uses that to point out to them, look, supporting the men of God, you need to learn the idea that when you have a generous heart and you have the right heart's attitude about giving your money to the Lord, and this isn't your pastor here this morning saying this because I want you to stoke up the offering plate here today. What you give to the Lord between you and Him, and guess what? If He wants this church to continue strong and He wants to do things and add and grow this ministry, He doesn't need any of your wallets. That doesn't mean he doesn't want your heart to give generously. It's just, we get so fixated in the mouth. It's like, well, I'm only a good Christian if I give this. No, stop! 
The word worship or, uh, really was originally pronounced, and we've said this many times in the last couple weeks, worship. You really want to have a heart to heart, and you better be prepared for what the Holy Spirit might tell you. But you want to know what you should give as far as an offering and tithe to the church? Get down on your hands and knees and say, God, what are you really worth to me? And then say, God, what is it that you've given to me? Because nothing I have is really mine. Everything I have has come from you. What do you want me to give, Lord? And I don't care what that amount is. If that's our heart attitude, <laughs> the blessings that come with that are beyond measure. That's what Paul's trying to beat into them. Because these churches in Macedonia, the Thessalonians, the Philippians, the Bereans, they weren't wealthy Christians. But they made sure to provide and take good care of Paul. And God blessed them in ways that are incomprehensible. You know, it may be a joy for us one day to get to heaven and to talk to some of those members of the churches at Thessalonica and, and Berea and Philippi and ask them, so what was it like when you were supporting Paul? And, and I can just hear some of those voices saying, well, you know, we didn't have much, but God always supplied. We never went without. And he blessed in ways that you couldn't even believe. Because that's, that's what he promises in his word. He's never broken a promise. Paul wanted the Corinthians to get that point. Not to support him as a man, but in giving unto the Lord so as to take care of God's man. They were being a blessing and they would no doubt be highly blessed by him. See, Paul's refusal to accept the wages from those he was serving was the result of a deep conviction. He says there, it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. He would have rather been dead than have anyone think that he was preaching and teaching for money. He wasn't a prophet for hire. He wasn't a modern day Balaam. He wasn't in the ministry for sword and game. It's this commitment that he declared to the Ephesian elders. I have coveted no one silver or gold or clothes. And you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, Paul was saying, shame on anyone who would say I'm doing this for my own interest. The only reason I do this is I'm not even telling you this because I'm trying to tout myself. I've been blessed because I know what the Lord's done for me. I know how wretched and despicable I am. Don't dare look at me as someone great. Look at how great my God is. How great he has to be in order to be able to take a butcher of Christians and still use me for his glory. I was just a bum. And he's using me to accomplish his perfect will. You know, the word boast that he uses there, it refers to that in which one glories in, or, or even the basis for glorying. It carries the idea of rejoicing or even reveling. Because it's frequently done in pride, boasting is usually a sin. But it need not be proud and sinful. See, Paul's boast wasn't intended to convey arrogance, but joy. He was glad for that spiritual privilege and commitment in which he rejoiced that he'd rather die than contradict him. He had his priorities straightened out. He was receiving his joy from exercising his privilege to restrict his freedoms rather than from using them. God's made it possible that I don't have to take any money from you. He's given me some ability and know how to build and make tents. And I can actually do some other work on the side so that I don't have to be a burden to you because I love you and I want to see you grow and come to know the Lord. And as you grow in Him, you'll get this concept of giving and then when God brings a man in here to serve full time, you'll take good care of him because you're first and foremost not trying to honor a man, but you're trying to honor the Lord. And if he's truly serving the Lord and being faithful to Him, it's a blessing to be a blessing to Him. Paul now takes the next few verses and explains to us what the reward is and what it isn't. He says, what's important? Well, it's the reward we have from Christ. And then even secondly, as we'll spend probably more of next week talking about, the even greater importance is waiting 
the lost to Christ. And he emphasizes it later in this passage. But go back to chapter 9 here. Let's look at verses 16 through 18. Paul says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I'm under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. There's two perspectives that Paul gives here in these verses. What the reward is and what it's not. First we see what the reward is not. The reward was not preaching the message. We say, what? Let me explain. Paul spoke of boasting in the Lord. It's a unique phrase. In 1 Corinthians 1.31, he says, Boasting in things, I'm sorry, in Romans 15.17, he says, Boasting in things pertaining to God and such. Even more often, he spoke of rejoicing in the gospel, of glorying in the cross, and supremely of glorying in Jesus Christ. But then he tells the Corinthians, If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. And Paul's trying to convey in, to the Corinthians that he gloried in the gospel but not for it. In the essence of, he had nothing to do with the gospel and supplying it. He just has the privilege of being able to proclaim it and share it. But he's not the author of the gospel. He simply was one that had received the revelation. In other words, he gloried or boasted in joy because of the gospel. He's not the source. He was a product of it. He wasn't boasting of his commitment to or, or his ability in preaching the gospel either. He did preach the gospel, possibly more diligently than anyone else we know of or can think of. But for this, he was under compulsion. The Lord stopped him short one day on the road to Damascus, and he was on his way there to persecute and butcher Christians. At that time, he was set apart as the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul chose God's call in the sense that he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, as he said in Acts 26, but he really had no choice. He was under compulsion, he says. As Paul would later realize, God had set him apart, even from his mother's womb, as he said to the Galatians. Just like Jeremiah and John the Baptist, Paul was called and ordained by God before he was ever born. And just like Jeremiah, Paul could refrain from preaching. He could choose not to do it, but when, when he was frustrated and despondent because of rejection and ridicule, Jeremiah tried to stop preaching, but it couldn't. In, in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, he said, But if I say, I will not remember him, or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. To the Colossians, Paul said, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me. In other words, it wasn't Paul's choice. It was God's. Paul isn't saying that he's some robot that has no choice, but because of the compelling of the Holy Spirit, he couldn't do anything else and be happy. I've come to learn that God sometimes calls, or that God calls some men into full-time ministry, but some men try to call themselves into full-time ministry. Unfortunately, not all of us are called to serve as pastors. But we are all called to serve. <laughs> to the men that God calls to serve them, I truly believe they'll never be happy or, or satisfied unless they're doing what God has called them to do. I've wondered at times what life would be like if God hadn't called me to preach. Yet the more that I serve Him, I realize that this is what He's called me to do. And I take great joy from the privilege that comes with serving Him in this capacity. The joy is not in the accomplishment. The joy comes from the one who's accomplishing his will through us, not us accomplishing our wills. You know, and, and it, it, it makes me think of someone I know. You know, we spent a lot of time in, in chapter six and seven talking about the importance of marriage and, and some of the difficult topics of singleness versus remarriage and divorce and all that. And yes, they're not pleasant conversations always to have, but the reason they're <coughs> preached on and the reason why they are included in God's Word is because marriage is an important decision. 
And I only emphasize that because when I, I've always had a love for teenagers. Part of it was because of my youth pastor. A man by the name of Donnie Clapham. To this day, he, he will, even though <laughs> He, he, he can almost come off as just a big joke. I mean, you know what? If he dyed his beard white and he's got a nice long one, uh, he could do a Santa Claus impersonation probably very, very well because he's big and jolly. But I love that man to death. And the love that he had for me, only then the Lord took and used and inspired in my heart to want to show that love to others. But it was freshman year of college. Right before I went off to college, we had been without a youth pastor at my home church for a couple of years. And my brother Ben, he, we had, it was good to have my brother and his wife with us last week, but um, my brother had started coming to the youth group and we didn't have a youth pastor. And so we had just hired a guy right before I went off to college. And I was excited and thrilled because after meeting Mike, I was like, man, this guy's an awesome guy. And I could tell he had a love for the kids. He loved his teenagers and you could tell it. And it was later, it was about a month and a half later after getting to college when my brother Ben uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. And while it was extremely difficult not being able to go home and see him, at least not, I didn't get to go home and see him until Christmas break, but every time I got on the phone with him, you know, wanting to talk to him and, you know, just like, how you doing and whatnot, he wouldn't shut up about Mike. Because Mike came and saw him in the hospital. And Mike started investing in him. <clears throat> I was thrilled for my brother. That he was getting to experience some of that same joy of having a youth pastor that really invested in him. I was like, this is, it was a blessing. Even though it got to be a little annoying every once in a while when I called. It's like, okay, what's new with Mike? Okay, let me get the update. Okay, now can I talk to you? <laughs> but I believe wholeheartedly that Mike was called in the gospel. Unfortunately, there were some difficulties and they didn't even stay at our church for a year. I mean, it was like they were, I think, only a couple weeks away from finishing their first year and he felt God pulling them out of the ministry. And I think there were some things going on. Um, he never fully shared it, but I, I got the impression things were going on and he got out of the ministry. And I remember seeing him a couple times. In fact, um, there was a, a tragic death of an old, a guy who was either a junior or senior in high school when, when he was there that, um, I take it back, he was even in college, but there was a, a guy in our church who had gotten really close to Mike and was a younger guy, but he passed away and, and Mike had come back from the funeral and I remember just talking to him and he just seemed empty. And he had gone off and he had gotten, I think he, I don't know if he became a dentist or like an assistant to a dentist or whatever, but he went and got a non-ministry job. But it's just every time I talked to him, it was just like he was a shell of a man. I was very, very ecstatic and thrilled to find out several years ago that God had called him back into ministry. And I'd, I've only spoken to him like once since then, but after getting back into ministry, there was a joy that seemed to be renewed. And I wholeheartedly believe if God's called you into the ministry and you try to run away, you try to pull a Jonah, you're going to be miserable. Now that doesn't mean that even though there is joy in serving the Lord that it's going to be perfect, easy, breezy, no problems. But there is a tremendous joy that comes from serving Him and being in the center of His will. For those He's called, there's no place you'd rather be. At some time or another, every preacher whom the Lord has called will realize that he is under God's compulsion. Believe me, there have been mornings where even through my own struggles or whatnot, that it was just like, I don't, I, I'm ready just to turn it in. There have been some moments, even in previous ministries, where I've gotten burned out, and I was just ready to walk away. It's just like, you know what, this, sometimes it really just doesn't feel like it's worth it. And in His grace, and His tender compassion, and He draws me in, and reminds me of what He's called me to do. And he renews my joy and he renews my strength and I get back up and keep serving him. And I'm thankful he doesn't give up on me every time I get close to walking away from him.
Are you? It's not that God's calling can't be ignored. It's not that God's calling can't be neglected or even slighted, but it cannot be changed. The man who resists God's call or tries to give up will, just like Jeremiah, experience a burning fire shut up in his bones until he obeys. He has no choice. Raymond Law read the story about a man who lived a careless and luxurious life for many years. And he wrote that in a vision one night, Christ came to him carrying a cross and said, Carry this cross for me, Raymond. Well, he pushed Christ away and refused. In a second dream, the same thing happened. Christ offered the cross and Raymond refused it. In the third dream, Christ comes and lays the cross in the man's arms and walks away. And his response was, what else could I do but take it up? Added to that sense of constraint is a serious and compelling responsibility which Paul articulates in the words, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. In effect, he says that failure to obey that call would result in his suffering, serious chastisement. The severest judgments are promised on unfaithful ministers. Paul gladly preached the gospel, but he did not do it voluntarily. Now, against my will doesn't indicate he was unwilling to obey, but that his will had no part in the call itself. It wasn't his choice to serve Christ. So consequently, he didn't receive a reward, but a stewardship. He was under obligation to preach for which he neither deserved nor expected reward. See, that word stewardship, it gives us something uh, or some responsibility that is valued to them. You know, when uh, back in the story of Joseph, when Joseph was working for Potiphar, Potiphar made Joseph the steward over his household. He put him in charge of everything in his house. He was a slave. But everything in his house were those things that he had earned, those things he had given, his family even, his, his money even. And he put him in charge of it. We've been given something truly incredible to be stewards over. Whether you're called to be a pastor or not, we're all called to be stewards of the gospel. You don't have to stand behind a pulpit to share Christ with someone, do you? We're all called to be stewards of his. That's the case in every call to minister. God gives the minister what he highly values for safe care and promises stern discipline to the one who falls short. That's why Paul uses that interjection, woe, to indicate the impending pain. We're going to stop here today. We'll pick up with what the reward actually is next week. But folks, I continue to question you. What's important? What's truly important in your life? It's a reward, it's a privilege to serve you. I pray you never look at it as an obligation, but when you consider what Christ has done for you, what is he worth to you? Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we love you. We praise you for who you are. Father, we praise you for being our redeemer. God, I humbly ask that you would continue to show that mercy and love and grace to us. Father, I pray that we would spend time every day coming into your presence. Lord, may we just become overwhelmed with who you are and what you've done for us. And Father, may that compel and even burden our hearts to live lives of obedience unto you. And Father, live lives that seek to tell others how they might come and experience true joy and peace and hope. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that, Lord, they've never come to that moment of accepting you as Savior, Lord, I pray today would be that day. Let them see your love. Help them to understand that love was proved in the great sacrifice you made on the cross. Help them to see the wonderful free gift of salvation made available. Lord, for those of us who've come to that point where we've already chosen to follow you, to serve you, to accept you as Savior, Lord, may we live for you. Father, may we be 
obedient until the last day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this morning, have a hymn of invitation, just as I am. You know the great thing? God doesn't need you to get better. It's not that you can then be able to serve Him. He just wants you to willing to say whatever you want for Just as I am. Let's sing it. Tuesday at 10 o'clock, ladies' Bible study. 
Uh, Wednesday, there's a, uh, at 10 o'clock, there's a ladies' paint class, and you can see Mindy or Sh uh, Shannon uh, if you have any questions about that. Uh, then 6 o'clock is the prayer meeting uh, hour, and um, on Thursday, uh, the ladies' Bible study again at 6 o'clock. And on Saturday, the guys, fathers and sons, are going to be meeting out at the Bachman Pond for a combination celebration and fishing derby and a shootout and a, and a cookout. So, uh, just a little bit of a heads up on some of that. Uh, uh, bring your favorite fishing rod and some bait uh, that uh, you like to fish with. Uh, what we have, we have bluegill, bass, and catfish. So that's uh, plan your bait accordingly to that, that species. And uh, also we're going to uh, have uh, uh, a shooting range set up. It's going to be a short range, so it's only going to be 100 yards. So uh, we'll be able to shoot handguns or long guns, but just be prepared that it's only going to be 100 yards. You don't have to shoot two or three miles or anything like that. We don't have that kind of room. But, uh, uh, with the ammunition situation like this, so expensive, you'll bring your favorite rifle or handgun, whatever, and some ammunition. But we will have some games and some friendly comp <clears throat> excuse me, friendly competition that we'll supply some ammunition for and, and we'll, we'll restrict you to some guns too on that. We'll, we'll, we'll provide guns for you, let's put it that way. And if, if you don't have a gun, you know, you can come and we'll provide you with a gun and some ammunition and get a you can do some shooting anyhow, so we'll, we'll take care of that too. Uh, and also, there's going to be some skeet shooting. Um, we have a, an ex, uh, experience ex par excellent in our group here that's going to help us out with some skeet shooting, and so Lee's going to do that. And uh, uh, so we're going to have a good time. So uh, just uh, prepare for men, prepare for that, and don't forget to sign up. We'd like to know how many's coming and. Uh, those sheets are back on the table, of course. Uh, and, and, and as Pastor already mentioned, uh, this is uh, uh, July is membership month, and uh, uh, it's not just tomorrow or just today that we're going to be receiving uh, uh, members. If, uh, if you uh, want uh, to be a member or see Pastor or one of the deacons, and we'll, we'll have a, we'll have that every Sunday for the rest of the month. <laughs> And pastors already touched on the Vacation Bible School uh, setup for next week. And then, uh, of course, the uh, Vacation Bible School is 19th through the 23rd. And by the way, that's going to be for third grade and up. I think there's some question about it. They thought maybe it was like kindergarten. It's going to be third grade, third grade, three years and up. <laughs> it's just a slight difference. <laughs> Glad we caught that. Three years and up. Eighth grade, so put that in the calendar, and uh, don't forget uh, baby shower for Ashley Brown on Sunday the twenty fifth here at the church. It's a girl, and that's all I have. Is there something else we might need to have have mentioned or talk about? All right, if not, let's pray and we'll leave up. We're not gonna pray. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one other thing I did forget to mention with VBS, uh, how many of you enjoyed coloring as a kid? Okay, so we have an adult form of coloring going on in preparing, pre preparing, <laughs> preparing for VBS. We've been doing a lot of um, paintings, and it's not like you have to draw and be an artist. It's really just um, clip art that we've blown up on transparency, and we've traced on big pieces of paper, and then you fill in the color with whatever color you like with a paintbrush and some color. But we're getting all those ready, and there's times available. Every day this week, we got still a lot of stuff to do to get ready before next Monday. So if you're available at all this week, even if you don't think I would be horrible at it, there's other stuff other than painting. You can help cut out the, the paintings that have been made, or you can even maybe if you come Monday or Tuesday, depending on how many we still gotta do, even just tracing. All you gotta do is put the transparency on and take a pencil and just trace the lines. It doesn't require a great camera, believe me. I helped paint a few yes or Friday. So if you see some really ugly looking paintings, just blame it on Pastor. Um, but we got a lot of stuff. We're trying to make this really fun and exciting for the kids. So at this time, 
I'm going to ask, we have quite a few families, and I want to clarify, we've kind of put a spotlight and an emphasis on membership this month. It's not that you can only join the church in the month of July, um, but we're trying to encourage folks. We want to see this church grow. And what membership is, it's identifying with the church. You know, there's nothing that, I can't keep any of you here. I may try, but I can't. I would try to keep you here because I love you all and it's a joy to serve the Lord, but what membership is, is coming and identifying with the church that this is where we serve and there's places for every single one of you. doesn't matter how old or how young you may be. God's called all of us to serve him. And so today we have several couples that are coming forward to unite with us. And so if you have any questions about what it means to be a member or you would be interested in joining this church, please come talk to me. Um, it's not like talking to the principal. I'm, I may look big and ugly and scary, but I try not to be so. Um, at this time, I'd like to have uh, Todd and Shanna and their kids come up and Steve and Cheryl and Josh and Bree and hey Ashley you want to run and grab Peter and Gavin and then Justice and Brandy and then some of you can stand on this side uh, and then Miss Judy or Joe you come on forward and so we've had the privilege to meet with uh, each of these individuals, and when we um, accept somebody into membership, the reason that Rich or Tom usually says, come see pastor or one of the deacons is we like to meet with them just to hear them give their testimony of salvation. Now, most of them probably would agree they didn't really want to come up here and share it publicly with you because most people don't like to speak up in front of everybody, but uh, one or a few of the different deacons have uh, been with me when we've met with them and they've shared their testimony and they've all placed their trust in Christ and they would like to join us in membership. So, do I have, where we're going to take a vote on this, all in favor of receiving these folks and we're just going to do it collectively. And if you say nay, you got to meet me out back when we get done. So, <laughs> But we're just going to do this collectively. All in favor of receiving each of these wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ into the membership of our church, say amen. Amen. All opposed? <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for trying to be, you know, imposing my will on people. <laughs> all right, well then, I'm going to close in a word of prayer, but then as soon as I finish praying, I would like to invite you all to come up, greet them with the right hand of fellowship, and uh, welcome them in. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you this morning, and we love you. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, not only to become one of your children, but Father, to serve you. Father, we thank you for this church, and we pray that, Lord, as you have promised to build the church, Lord, as we rely upon you to build it, Father, may we faithfully seek to honor you and serve you with our lives. Lord, I thank you for each and every one of these individuals. Father, I pray that you will use them in a great and mighty way here in the life of our church. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.